Welcome. Uh, today we will be talking on civil status and uh, we'll be watching two movies. Uh, one would be Edin Bronkovich and the other one would be Another Year. So first if you could watch Edin Bronkovich, a little part of the movie. In the film Aaron Brockovich, which is based on a true story, Julia Roberts plays Aaron Brockovich, an unemployed single mother of three young children. Her biker boyfriend George acts as a babysitter while Erin searches for a job with little success until she convinces lawyer Ed Massey to give her a job as an office clerk in his law firm. Erin throws herself into her work and in researching a routine case uncovers medical information which proves the Pacific Gas and Electric Company is poisoning water and making people sick at one of its plants. Aaron helps rally the community together and they, with the help of Ed Massey, take the huge corporation with its high-paid lawyers to court to win damages for the affected people. Eventually, thanks in major part to Aaron's hard work, they triumph, winning a record settlement in one of the biggest class action lawsuits in US legal history. So, how did you all like the movie? I loved it, I have to say. It was absolutely magic. Um, a, a real coup for the, you know, what can I say, the woman there, the single woman with her three children and, uh, you know, how she came up trumps. Uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. I don't know what the rest of you thought of it. And would, would someone like to elaborate on civil, civil status in civil society? Civil status yeah. is when you're equally entitled to the same treatment, whether you're single, married, separated, divorced, widowed, in a civil partnership or previously in a civil partnership, that everybody should be treated the same. Thank you. And uh, how did you find uh, Julia Roberts' role in this film? Was it, I think it was very powerful um, as I, every woman. I thought she was brilliant. She actually won an Oscar for it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny as well because um, I heard she stood, like she sat down with Erin herself for a long time before the film and just kind of got to know her that way and then led the character from there. And even the director, Steven Soderbergh, he took a lot of liberties, like he changed some stuff around, but he still tried to keep it like to the fact. And anything that he changed, he actually asked Aaron's permission first. So he was very respectful in that way too. So like, yeah, just to bring it along. Mm. I think it brought home for me in terms of, going back to the single mother again, how difficult it is uh, in terms of childminding, you know, to try to do any kind of a job outside of the home, given that you've got a full-time job at home as well, but to try to do that uh, and try to manage what happens at home as well. You could see how, how much it really was a struggle when her babysitter left her down. You know, she was lucky that the guy next door, as it turned out, you know, turned up, was there the, the day that the baby minder dropped the kids home. Um, it just kind of brought it back, really brought it forcefully home for me how difficult it is that, you know, it's an uphill struggle. You know, it's difficult enough to get employment anyway from time to time you know and you can see she was having difficulty but you know even more difficulty again given that she had you know responsibilities at home. That's interesting as well because you have the media nowadays like painting this image of, of the, the single mother sitting at home having five kids and living on the dole and benefits like that but if the woman can't get a job like I mean I'm not saying she's doing the five kids because of that but you know, they, they won't give the benefits, they won't, you know, um, help her out with that. And then at the same time, she's being chastised for, for staying at home as well. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a tough situation. So in terms of that, the film was like a, a good depiction of, of a woman in that circumstances, but how many outside in the broader context are, are not getting jobs, not getting the education or the training they need to get those jobs. Um, no, it was, it, was, it was interesting for them on that point. Like, or the support, the government would say that to support family, whether that's being run by a single person or two people in the household. But what I have found the last couple of years since I had children myself is that from talking to other people, even if they have somebody living in the house with them that's co-parenting, that they would lie to employers and say they were sick rather than say their child is sick because it's thrown back again and again. Well, you know, your child was sick. Oh, we don't want to hear about your child being sick. You've got a job and that there's no, even and that a crash won't take a sick child, which is fair enough, so you don't want to spread it. But then you're left 
if you're not in your family, if you don't have some, like most people may not have somebody who last minute in that morning when you wake up and your child has a fever to take them. So you have no choice but, and that, you know, everybody knows it's happened to anybody that has children. And yet everybody pretends it doesn't because there is no support for them or no allowances for sick days for people with children to say, well, look, you know, we, there's such amount you can take. Or, you know, the people as adults, you think, and uh, civilised society that we come to some kind of reason that we'd realize, we all realise it happens, but to actually think that people have to lie and say that they have you know, an illness themselves or appointments or whatever else, but just can't basically tell the truth that everyone has children that may be sick at home. And then it, that's a, exactly, if you haven't got somebody else at home, imagine if you're trying to hold any job alone in the house and you've got nobody else to turn to. Uh, <clears throat> myself, personally, I love the movie. First, I, I'm, I'm somebody who likes real life stories. I, I kind of enjoy those movies more than fiction. And secondly, what I took most is that film shot, was shot a while ago, but it's actually the true portrayal what the current system is. Mm -hmm. For example, first, if you look whether men or women who are um, uh, kind of in the mature, or um, um, if I mean mature, I mean 23 and above of, of age, they are classed as mature. If you try to look for employment now, if you lose employment, it's really difficult for you to get a job because you're competing with uh, people who just graduated, so that the ones who are needed and wanted in the market. And you could see the struggle she faced to actually even get somebody to, to, to bring a, to, to, for, for, for an interview. It was an uphill struggle. And eventually she had to kind of held hostage this guy who had helped uh, in, in, in a previous case. So to actually force it that I'm not leaving. She actually said, don't, please don't make me beg. I'm not leaving here until I get a job. And that's ex exactly what the current job market is. And then it come, you, you look at this different situation. OK, you get a job now. So how, who are you going to leave your, your, your children with? You're a single person. Mm -hmm. So it's the current struggles that people, both men and women, I know in women it becomes much more harder, but both men and women are struggling, especially if you are deemed to be in, in, in out of work and they are mature. It struck me as well in terms of, you remember that part, where, do you remember that part where she was looking for the benefits or the uh, extra pieces added to the job? Um, that childcare wasn't actually mentioned and it didn't actually dawn on me until the postman arrived at the door with the keys to this car outside plus a cheque for 5,000 and, and the note from her boss said something like, you know, get childcare or get back up. I can't remember the exact words now. But it struck me, oh yeah, that, you know, that could actually help her out here. Yeah. But it didn't, the penny didn't drop for me until I saw that, that yeah, that's something that's, uh, shall we say, a benefit that could be considered by employers to help um, certainly uh, people who don't have, as you say, somebody at home, you know, co-sharing, co-parenting, um, it would be something else that kind of gives them the equal, um, but let's say, equal situation, equal ground that other people would have. You can see anywhere that has, like, crashes which may be within the company, or flexible hours, or even the same thing that the fees may be incorporated, the, the waiting lists are out the door, but it's the, when they've done studies, it's those employees that are much, much happier and genuinely seem to succeed better at the job, specifically the women, because they're saving the commuting time, they're bringing a child with them into the yeah. workplace, so it's not worrying about that. They know they're there if there is a sickness or whatever else, mm -hmm. and they also feel that they're getting the picking up the child straight away when they finish work or whatever else, but like in Ireland, there isn't the determination behind the government to want, you know, they know all these things, other countries are doing it very successfully, but they know they don't, they don't want to because then that's it. They obviously don't really want these women back mm -hmm. in the workforce, or there has to be some agenda behind it because if they wanted to allocate the money there, it certainly could be. And, in spite of her being, um, what do you think about the case that she had and she fought in spite of all the children and she, like the man thought she couldn't do it. Yeah. Like, you know, because men couldn't, nobody could do it. He being such a big lawyer and all that. And did, like, what did you feel about you know, that? I, I thought that part was really interesting because like we talk about family and how she was getting this job for her kids. But as well, on the other hand, she says at one point, she's like, now I have people who are finally respecting me and don't ask me to give that up and she doesn't just do it for her kids she does it for these people who aren't being represented at all that are really like being stood on by this corporation and it's um like even there's her, she has a great like brief monologue at one point where she states that um ed asked her 
you're making this personal and it isn't. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, I, it is personal because that's my work and that's my time away from my kids. Mm -hmm. And if that's not personal, I don't know what is. Yeah. So like that sums up her character right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting as well, the, like I th it is really summed up in, I think the tagline is the true story about a woman who brought a small town to its feet and a multi-million dollar corporation to its knees. Mm -hmm. And that just describes it all there. And even how just how the story goes about and how it unravels and how she finds just this one detail of how the medical files are put in with, um, with just the request to buy their property and how she finds this over, over this spreads out into the entire town. And then they later find out that there's plants all over the country, perhaps even all over the world. And it just shows that like what one person could just overlook completely, another person picks up on. And what if Aaron wasn't there? Like think of the fatalities that may have happened just in case, and definitely think of how they wouldn't have been compensated. And on one hand, you've got the Ed character who is your typical lawyer, but he can't sympathize with the people in the way Erin can. Mm -hmm. So they need Erin on board, even though she doesn't have the law or the legal knowledge to get by, yeah. And, mm. and what, what I liked about, about uh, for example, when she picked out that there was something amiss between medical records being uh, placed at the same place where with the real estate. Um, I like the fact that it debunks the myth that all beautiful women or all beauty mm. queens are just dumb people. Yes. Mm. She is the one who picked her. It's, 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 it's a, a, a place that was pegged with the lawyers, but nobody picked up. She picked it up and she went straight. She had the confidence to go to the boss and say, look, there's something wrong here. Can I investigate it? And probably is, is her yeah, boss just answered it just to get try to get rid of it just okay just do whatever you can do mm -hmm. but i like the fact that she debunks that myth and then when she was talking to her uh, when when your boyfriend was questioning her parental skills coming home late and with a bag you know usually when somebody's if bag their things your kind of think somebody's going to say oh i'm sorry don't do that i'll try to change but she didn't she just told him if you want stay if you yeah. don't go so I, I, I like that character that if somebody is on a mission to get something, usually there are a lot of things that you are going to find that is going to make it difficult for you. Yeah. But if you stay determined, you can get where you, you want to, to, to get to. Yeah. I like that character from you. Yeah. But I don't think it's about a woman. It's, I think everybody's mental attitudes and you know, character, it speaks a lot. Yeah. If someone mm -hmm. wants to do it, if they want to take the easy way, They'll do it. Anyway, we had a nice discussion <laughs> about her, and so let's watch our next movie uh, another year. 2010's Another Year, directed by Mike Lee, tells the story of Tom and Jerry, a North London couple who have been happily married for years and who are emotionally and financially secure. The film takes place over the course of a year, starting in summer as the contented couple tend to their allotment in the community garden. Still living in the couple's happy home is their 30-something son, Joe, who's happy having just met his new girlfriend, Katie. Each of the film's episodes is represented by a season, and as summer turns to autumn, we're introduced to Mary, who's middle-aged, alone, and more than a little needy. And she's devastated when she meets Katie, having foolishly carried a torch for Joe. As dependable as the seasons and as sure as winter will follow the autumn, Tom and Jerry's relationship also highlights the transience and sadness in the lives of their friends and relatives. When Tom's brother's wife passes away, heartbroken, he stays with them for a time. Mike Lee's film Another Year tells us that life is not always kind, but like the seasons themselves, it blooms and it fades. So guys, what did you think about this movie, Another Year, a completely different movie from Erin Bronkovich? Mm -hmm. Completely different. Real picture of the ordinary life like like just lovely couple going about their business um, the, it was almost like a play like the, yeah. the words just mm. yeah. the dialogue just moved along nicely it was it was it was lovely lovely shot 
um, and lovely written like film. Like. And very family based as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. What struck me about it was, I thought I really, because I hadn't seen it at all before, but I genuinely thought it was one of the most realistic films I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. I just thought from the character's perspective and the screenplay perspective, it wasn't, it wasn't this type of film that is going along and we can predict what happens next and we can yeah. predict what happens to the characters. Um, like, some, like even the two central characters, Tom and Jerry, are... <laughs> um, they um, go about go about their lives, and nothing really terrible happens to those characters. Mm -hmm. And I thought that when you see these like put together characters who are like doing so well in life, I thought, well, by the end of the film, it's all going to fall apart for them. Something's going to happen. Someone's going to die. Mm -hmm. But then when it kind of ended up good for them, I was very happy because it's nice to see. No. Good things happening to good people as well, and that's like real life in the sense of you don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't, it doesn't follow this idea of this Hollywood screenplay. Like some people get off scot free, some people don't. Yeah. If you look at the Mary character in it, like you know, so uh, I did find it really, really realistic, and that's what I liked most about it. I think yeah. it was nice to see, you know, all these movies a marriage that was very simple and that seemed to work, you know? Yeah. And it had some of those things that we spoke about, like in the last movie, that Jerry was a working mother, uh, albeit her, her son is an adult and, and independent at that particular point. But um, <coughs> it was interesting to see that as well. Um, I also thought the portrayal of Mary was quite poignant in, in terms of, and Ken, the other character, the friend of Tom and Jerry's, is like two single people and how sad it can be for people who are single in the world. And I, I think that's often something that maybe, um, you, know, it, you know, can be overlooked in terms of there's such an emphasis in society on marriage and on family. Especially that, at that age. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is. That it's interesting to watch and, and in terms of almost like what their options are at that stage because one guy is facing retirement, Ken, and, you know, is, is anxious about it, what would he retire for? And I know having worked in the area of pre-retirement, uh, you know, it is something that, that's up for a lot of people. It's different if you have a family, if you have a wife, and if you have ch you know, children and grandchildren. Um, you have a lot of things to fill your time with, you have hobbies or interests, but you could see that both of them actually um, were, were resorting to drink more and more, which is quite interesting. It was, it was there as well. And for many people who are lonely, unfortunately, that's what happens. I've read a number of articles recently about singledom and the pleasures of, the pleasures of it and the positive sides of being single. Um, and maybe in suggesting that all single people are lonely, that we might be buying into, again, a paradigm which is sort of um, generated by the powers that be, whoever that is, you know, that you know, you, you need to be part of a family, have two children and have the car and the house and all of that and the whole consumer thing around the family, that maybe just being single is okay as well. Oh, and if, if we, yeah, if we, if we sort of, um, if we prepare ourselves for that and if we manage to uh, move away from the, the pressures that are brought on us by um, society to be part of a couple. I think yeah. in the film it was more like I know they were single people and, and that, that, that is a good point. We do kind of look at, oh, he should really get with someone like that. But I think it was more, from what I could tell, it was unhappy people. They just happened to yes. be single. That's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, yeah I think that's... Unhappy, but no, it's a good point. I was, just, talking, just, I was had, just bringing that point here yeah, and like using yeah. that as to, to make the point that... The two characters. Yeah, they just yeah. had bad ways of trying to get happiness. Like mm. for Kenny, he was just eating and drinking all yeah, the time and yeah. trying to get, I guess, a buzz. And for Mary, um, you know, she, she, she wanted companionship and comfort, um, I, I guess, like from, from what we could tell about her. And, and she wasn't going to get that the way she was carrying on. Um, I always found that the way she, when she showed up, she was always yeah. real kind of flustered, like all of a sudden when she walked into a scene, like she, she was a great character, yes. but, but I think a sad person. Like, yeah, I can agree with you, especially on the consumerism side, because if you look at Mary, um, Mary's uh, character, she was somebody who was much focused on getting things. For example, she talked about holidays, she talked about getting a car. Mm -hmm. So to her, having that kind of, those kinds of material things was very, very important. So she, after she got a car, she went in so many travels because she explained getting tickets, tires, bears, the, sum, uh, the car being torched, and she was spending loads of money 
on that car, just trying to maintain the symbolism of having a car. And then she couldn't go to a holiday because she was supposed to go to a holiday and then the car broke down and stuff like that. So she was very much into the symbolism of material things that yeah. you talked about. Mm -hmm. You do meet people like that, and, and like that again, I suppose, the classic, we don't know what her background is in terms of her family situation that has her in that, uh, and we're back to family again in terms of this, the act that we were talking about, because um, again, the portrayal is that Tom and Jerry had this perfect marriage and a perfect family with their son. Um, and I'm just think, picking up a point that you had earlier on, Mary, which is in terms of the, um, when we were talking about the, the sadness of the single person. If, I'm just thinking about it now, and just Michelle and I heard you talking, you just came, yeah, penny dropped, that the son was depicted, at least I saw him depicted as being unhappy or sad or melancholy at some level until he met this Katie girl. Mm. So when he was single, he was unhappy. Yes. Mary is unhappy and Ken is unhappy. So the single people in the film, in the movie, are all unhappy people. And then, you know, the son, I can't remember his name now, he suddenly becomes very happy when he's met this woman. Like, he's gone from sad to happy, like, he's, so, he's sorted now, like, you know, problem solved. Um, so, and again, we're buying into the, the Victorian thing, or back into the family thing again. You can only be happy yeah. if you buy into this idea or if you can manage to attain this or whatever. As you say, there's no such thing as a happy person in the movie, certainly, who is single, um, which is not the case in reality. Oh, you know? uh, it's, it's actually a, a taboo, you know? If you're, not, if you're about crossed your 35s and you're not married, oh, you're not married, are you? Oh, she's married. And, you know, the, the thing about friends, even in between friends and think family, oh, you're not married, you didn't get somebody, you yeah. know, you don't have children at... 40. So I think it's mo mostly social taboo. I remember the first time I moved to Italy and it was like everybody had to hold on to their partner. Like, I have a partner, I have someone. It would be like nearly a crime. I think, oh my God, they're going to slap me if they think I don't have someone to hold on to because yeah. sit on the bus, sit on your person, slap, make sure you have a person, you know? It's like, what is the story? You have to be a couple. It must be a crime not to be part of a couple in Italy. And even that, when I used to be going out, I was like, I'm kind of my friends. Girls. Yes, girls, that's who my friends are. Yeah. And your boyfriend's gone, nope, we're just going here. And then I was like, oh, that's why, you know, and they're going to meet you later. Are they going to collect you? Are they going to bring, no, no, I'm fully grown up now. I can actually get myself to a pub, believe it or not. So they're like, what the hell is wrong with these people? But I realized, okay, it's just a different culture. I thought it was European, but no, it's actually different cultures. Whereas in Ireland, okay, it wouldn't be like that. But on the other hand, it's, a, it's much more, people are clever the way, okay, aunties maybe would always be the ones about, you know, you're only getting engaged, then it's married, then it's first kid, then it's only had the first kid. When's the second one going to come out? Yeah. First one's going to be lonely. Yeah, you're getting, yeah. getting pushed onto the grave all along. I think that's the thing, because the, the ground talks about that too, doesn't talks about equal status for people who are divorced. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting point too, because, um, you know, as you say, um, um, Michelle, if you're expected to be part of a couple, or that's kind of the norm, or, or what, what society kind of gears you towards, and if that doesn't work out, the saddest thing, I think, uh, um, We've probably all seen it, but I certainly have is, you know, people who are unhappy in a relationship, it is the loneliest place to be, I would imagine, from what I can see and what I've heard of it. And there are people who, I think for somebody to separate or divorce, those people are exceptionally brave, I think, because yeah. you have to be very brave to stand, particularly the ones who did it years ago, like yeah. when it was early days, um, in Ireland certainly, um, to step outside of the status quo and to say that I am different or, you know, I, I remember there was um, a couple on, on where, I, where I grew up and, um, and they split up, it's a good few years ago now, and I remember when they, when they did, first of all, I come from a rural town, there was, there was a lot of talk about it and they said it was like an awful thing to happen and, you know, whereas you see people who are married for 30, 40, 50 years and, and you know because they tell you the marriages are very unhappy and yet they have these big parties for being 40, 30 years yeah. married. <laughs> like, they're like medals for longevity. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but that's a, you know, but like really, if, if anybody was, if there's a bit of integrity or, you know, courage from the individuals in it, and they say, you know, in it that sometimes they stay in a marriage for the children's sake, well, you know, particularly little children are like sponges, they pick up everything. So, you know, as children get older, obviously, they, they're more aware of an awful lot. So kids know when things are not happy. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, like you, you question that, they're there for the sake of the kids. If it's an unhappy place for the kids to be, then people, children grow up with this unhappy environment, seeing it as being normal, and they take that unhappiness into, the, into their own relationships. We have to find how in society we can be more welcoming and not feel so worried about people that are separated or divorced or if the children, you know, like that's it, making them feel, well, you know, what would you know now you only have them every second Saturday or blah, 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 whatever else. And overall, you know, society is changing, but we have to change with it. And a plus factor on that, I remember a friend of mine who has um, separated saying to me that um, 
when she split up from her husband and the husband had them every second weekend, they actually spent more time with their father when they were separated than they ever <laughs> did when, when they were married, mm. one part of it. But going back to your point, Michelle, um, um, I have uh, two friends I can think of specifically who are female who are, are, are divorced and um, one of them said to me exactly your story that she felt other and it was her girlfriends who were married and she had been invited out to things before but she felt herself being excluded more and she knew that she was seen as a threat mm. uh, to their husbands you know she was not interested in their husbands mm. but she was seen as a threat to that and another woman who's um, a good bit older than me, this is a few years ago, saying to me that um, when she got married and she moved into this neighbourhood, um, one of the women across the road was very good to her. She was a small child at the time and she used to mind the child when she was stuck in terms of, like you were saying, about baby minding, which, you know, when she was working. And uh, she, uh, she, she got to know this neighbour and she said to her, um, the neighbour was saying, yeah, so, um, and, and your husband, you know, she said, oh no, sir, I'm divorced. She said, and you can go and tell all the women on the road there that I'm not interested in their husbands. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so that thing, unfortunately, um, it's sad to say that that still exists in Irish society. Yeah. You know, I, I guess exist. that um, it might have something to do with the herd um, mentality, you know, when we're all like a herd together and if, if somebody steps outside that herd, they're seen as a threat. Yeah. Like, like you were, both of you were saying, you know, it's, it's, that's the bottom line, isn't it? And the person who has the gumption to get up and leave a relationship and move away is definitely a threat to the whole status quo. Yeah. 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 Especially because they seem so like this risk like they're this risky character because a lot of women might view it as well I'm here in my unhappy marriage well this woman got up yeah, yeah, well, and she was able to leave her yeah, husband yeah. like what's her to stop her from looking at my husband now even though our relationship isn't you know so when they see kind of the rebel or the daredevil in the group yeah. it's not like it's frowned upon, like, But there's comfort you know. in numbers mm. as well. It's great, great yeah. if we're all mm. unhappy together rather yeah. than somebody <laughs> going <laughs> off, you know. Anyway, yeah. guys, we had a nice discussion. That was lovely. Thank you.